Hello Year 11, welcome to our revision video. Here he is. Are you going to help? Uh-huh. <laughs> you all showed me, and you walk into a bank, turn off the cameras. Did you see that though? You're so ugly that you only want to only want to you when they went into a haunted house, you came out with a job application. Beat that. You're so ugly that when you're born, you got tinted windows in the incubator. Can't see me. You're so ugly that you have to sneak up to your mirror. You're so ugly that your doctor's a vet. You're so ugly that you make onions cry. <sighs> You're so ugly that even the tide won't bring you in. Sorry, mate. You're so ugly that a farmer's read a picture of you as a scarecrow. You work quite well, actually. You're so ugly that they call you Moses because every time you say who they live, the water parts! <laughs> <laughs> You're so ugly that when you saw Boomerang, it didn't come back. And finally, you're so ugly that when you're born, the doctor take one look at you and slap their parents. What are you doing? What are you actually doing? I'm helping with the mocks. You're helping with the mocks? Eh? I thought I was... No. Meant to be. No. No. You said you were doing a mock Not exam. Not that kind of mock. Okay, just be quiet. Well, how many marks did I get? I'll be going now. It's when 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 it's a it's a mock it, it's a practice it's a it's not the it's, it's not that kind of mock. Should I just be uh Okay, I'll, I'll just see myself out. You're so ugly. <laughs> I knew you were gonna come back in. Knew you were gonna come back in. I'm back <laughs> in, and I'm gone. Bye. We could be here a while. Here's your party time. <laughs> Last one. This one isn't an ugly one, okay? This is the funny one. You're so fat that when you turn around, it's your birthday. <laughs> Stupid. That you took a ruler to bed. See how long you slept for. Why can't he be normal? Why can't he be normal? That is why you need to stick in at school. That is why you need to revise. Because if you don't. Yeah. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the revision topics that I sent out and give you some prompts and tips on some of the stuff. So excuse me while I keep jumping over here to see what they were. Identify input and output devices. Uh, you may get you may get asked to identify in, some input and output devices. Doddle first lesson back in year, year nine. Um, typically, you might get asked to identify input devices in a particular scenario, in a particular situation. I have a mobile phone here. It is my mobile phone. It is an S7. It's appalling. Android is appalling. That's not. Um, that's not going to be on your exam. That's just a piece of advice. Just, just, uh, just buy an Apple. All right. So this looks like this is this is a computer system, the same as my Mac is a computer system, and this window, <laughs> this Windows thing is a computer system is a computer system i know it's a computer system because it is input on it it has output on it and it processes it it's got input devices on it uh it's got output on it uh, and it processes it does things so five seconds talk amongst yourselves what are the input devices on this i say devices you know the input mechanisms the input things
think about getting information from the real world into a device. So what information do you get from the real world into this device? So what hardware can we use? Well, I keep waving it around. There's a camera on the back of it. It's quite a nice camera, I suppose. It's a bit fuzzy sometimes. But it's a camera. It takes images from the real world, or moving images, and it puts them in the camera. In the camera. Oh, I should have said in the phone. Something that's often overlooked, switches. Volume switches in this case. Puts a power switch on the other side, and maybe other things. If you put, if you put like, <laughs> right, Inputs, in, input device one, up volume, input device two, down volume switch, and you're not going to get the marks, okay, so a volume switch, you're not going to get a mark for power once you've already mentioned a switch. So we've got camera, we've got, yeah, you can't do front facing camera, rear facing camera, it's not going to happen. Um, fingerprint reader, it's got a sensor on it, that takes the information in from the uh, outside world. Uh, it's got other sensors on it as well, it's got an accelerometer on this. That, I'm not saying that this is the one that's going to be in your exam. There might be other situations as well. Uh, what else has it might got on here that's input? Just because you plug it in, doesn't mean it's input. So, for example, uh, the charging cable. Yeah, you plug it in, but it's not sending information from the real world into the computer into the computer system. The headphone jack isn't sending information in just because you plug it in. It's, you think about your sensors. Think about. Uh, hearing, so it'll have a, have a microphone on it somewhere. Um, smell, can't do anything on a phone with smell. Sight, we've mentioned cameras. Touch, it doesn't have a physical keyboard. So if you ask for input devices, a software keyboard isn't a device, it's not real, it's a computer program, a software keyboard is a computer program, so that does not count. Uh, output devices, there aren't many. Again, think of your sensors. We see, so what do we see? A screen, not a monitor, we see a screen. Uh, what other output devices will we hear? It's got speakers. Uh, what are the output? It vibrates, touch, we could can hear that. Hurry up, Apple, release the next iPhone. So where do we get output devices? So it vibrates, it's got speakers on it for notifications. Um, it's got the screen on it. So there's fewer, uh, there's fewer output devices than input devices. Okay, the next one. Explain the purpose of RAM. Uh, random access memory stores. It holds things temporarily. Okay, the kinds of things it holds are things like the operating system. When you start your computer up, the operating system is on the hard disk. You don't use all of the operating system all of the time. So when you start your computer up, the reason why it can take a while um, is because it's, it's reading the operating system from the hard disk, it's getting all that information, and it's reading it and it's putting it in the memory in the RAM. So if you were able to check how much RAM you were using on your computer right now, it would, a big chunk of it would be taken up, even though you might just be watching this video, you might just have a web browser open. Because it's got the operating system in there as well. It's loaded Windows or OS X or whatever into the um, into into the me memory, into the RAM, because it's faster. What else does it, oh, parts of the operating system anyway. Um, what else does it hold in RAM? It holds the programs you are running. So if you are watching this using a web browser, it's loaded all of that information on that computer program, which is a web browser, it's a computer program. It's taking it from the hard disk, it's not running it from the hard disk, it's putting it in its memory, it's putting it in its RAM, and it's running it from there. And when you close it, when you kill it, it takes out RAM and it allows other programs to use that space in memory. So random access memory holds running programs, um, it holds the operating system, it holds any data that may be in use. Um, so, for example, if you've got a Word document, and you're typing into Word, I like this video now, I haven't pressed save yet. <gasps> I haven't pressed save yet. Um, but it's still there, it still exists. I haven't pressed save. I haven't pressed save. When I press save, it'll make a copy on the hard disk of it. But currently, it's just in the computer's RAM. That's why you need a load of RAM if you're doing video. Um, it holds data, such as a Word document that you haven't saved. Even if you do save it, it's still in RAM because you're going to type, continue to type. Uh, the operating system programs. 
What was the next bit? Oh, what's virtual memory? Well, you know when I said you needed a lot of memory for um, a video? What happens if you run out of memory? Well, your computer goes really slow and then it might switch itself off. So what computers typically do is they have a, a, a space on the hard disk which is reserved called virtual memory. And the RAM, anything it's not using at the time and anything the computer thinks, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to be using that for a while. It, it drops it out of RAM, and puts it on the hard disk. So it's there, if you need, even though it hasn't been saved or whatever, it's there to be pulled back if it needs it. But if I'm a bit distracted because there's a big pause of me pulling a funny face on the screen here, I need to, can I just hang on a minute, let me minimise that. Right. So... Um, Spider-Man waved at me today. Sp did Spider-Man wave? Did you see Spider-Man? Did you see Spider-Man today? I saw him twice. Once on the way to work and uh, once on the way home and he waved. Spider-Man waved at me today. So virtual memory, it's, uh, it's a place on the hard disk. Usually a percentage of the hard disk is allocated to be virtual memory. RAM, the CPU uses it to put things that is stored in RAM that it's not going to be used for a while. And temporarily puts it there to free up RAM for things that it will need. Um, because obviously it's on a hard disk. Hard disks are slower than RAM. Um, so you don't want to be dumping loads of stuff on the hard disk that you're going to be using. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, different types of secondary storage justify the selection of storage media. So, for example, uh, if you wanted to distribute a... Uh, if you wanted to distribute this video, what would be the best way to do it? And then give a reason why. So if you wanted to distribute it physically, then a way to do that would be to put this on DVD or a CD. Why? Because this video is, I don't know, I'm just going to guess here, um, 50 meg. Let's just make up a number. So this video is 50 meg, so I'm going to put it on a CD because this CD is cheap. Uh, it's cheaper than a memory stick. Uh, it's compatible. Most computer systems can play CDs. Um, you can put it in the post. And it's durable as well. It lasts for a while. Uh, yeah. Identify the purpose of web file types. Well, we've done some work on this in class. Um, common web file types, stuff that you download Typically, um, JPEG, which would be an image file. MPEG would be a movie file. GIF, not GIF. It might be GIF, but it's not. It isn't. GIF uh, is a series of still images that are played back um, in sequence to create an animation. Uh, but actually, a GIF can be a still image as well. Before you get anim before you got animated GIFs, you just had GIFs. Uh, zip could be a compressed file or multiple files compressed um pdf contains uh text and diagrams and images in a in a common standard format uh you know what most of them are avis and is, is a video file you know that you know that you do you do you got this you got this uh explain the purpose of ht html all right what does HTML stand for? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? HTML stands for hypertext mark. All right, all right. Yeah, I heard you. Hyper. All right. Hypertext markup language. Well done. You got it right. Hypertext markup language. Hypertext is the linkies that you click on. Markup. Uh, markup is like bold, italic. It, it's how you mark up. A paragraph how you label a paragraph for formatting come back to that so hypertext markup language it's not a programming language it's not a programming language you can't do loops you can't do loops you can't do well, you can't do variables can you but you, you, there's no program flaw there's no if, if statements uh, there's no loops there's no case statements so it, it's not a programming language it's a scripting language it starts at the top and the web browser just interprets each line at a time all the way from top to bottom, in order, in sequence. There's no program flow. It's a scripting language. 
explain the purpose of HTML. Well, HTML, um, hypertext markup language, the code HTML does uh, a number of things. It can be used to link to other HTML pages. It can be used to link to images. So if you see a web page, any web page, let's take the wooden web page, you log onto it, you see the wooden web page, and it's got some images in it. They're not embedded inside of a HTML page, like in a Word document. The links to the images, and the web browser just pulls those images and displays them when it receives that bit of code, so they're not embedded inside. So it links to images, it can link to uh, other common file types that we've just discussed, like zip files or uh, movie files. Okay. Um, markup, yeah, so the layout, what else does an HTML file do? It describes the layout of a page, it describes whether something is bold, whether a piece of text is italic, whether there's a horizontal rule, old school, there's a horizontal rule there. Um, it describes the colour of the page. Uh, just you know visually what the layout whether it's in a table or not my uh, my laptop's trying to log on there we go I have to do the blue steel look to get my lock because it, it does my face recognition anyway uh, what else was I said what else does HTML do uh, oh it's standard the good thing about HTML is it's standard, it's a text, it's standard text file, just like your Python code when you did a text file. You saved it as a text file to read your compressed, um, uh, you know, your compressed text file in your indexes. HTML is just the same as well, so really, really simple devices can understand text files. They're not particularly heavy, but it's not difficult, there's not a lot of processing power to understand a text file. Uh, washing machines, fridges that are slightly intelligent, um, microwaves, any device really is capable of reading a simple text file if you program it to. Which is why HTML is so popular because when it first started computers were really low powered. There were lots of different types of computers and it was one of those things where it didn't matter where you were, whether it went, when you had a Mac or whether you had a Windows machine or what version of the Windows machine you had. They could all read it which back then was a big deal. Now most things read most things, most apps are across all platforms. It doesn't matter that much really if you've got a different device apart from Mac's better and iOS is better. But it doesn't really matter that much anymore. It used to then, nobody could share anything at all. If you see, if you had a Word document in a Windows machine, you couldn't do anything with it on a Mac. Along came HTML, along came um, so Tim Berners-Lee with the web. And it didn't matter what computer you're on. It didn't matter whether you were using um, Mosaic web browser, yeah, Netscape, or I can't, I can't remember, Mozilla or whatever. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. It didn't matter what browser you were using. It didn't matter anything yeah, because any computer could read it because it was standard. Okay, uh, define a LAN or a WAN. First of all, local area network, wide area network. There's some marks right there. Uh, and then, if if you describe in them, describe the differences. Describe what they are. Describe what the other one is. And if what you've said is different about them both, then you've described the differences. So wide area and local area network. So let's describe a network first. Um, a network is computers or devices that are connected to each other. To each other. They're not just connected, they're connected to each other. Every net, every computer on the network is connected to another computer on the network. Then you describe whether it's local or wide area network. So a local area network, every computer is connected to each other in the same geographical location. So for example, Woodham, um, it's a network and it spans many buildings. Uh, it goes across and underground. The Woodham network is of a reasonable sized uh, kind of footprint, physical footprint. But it's in one area. It's in one area. It's in Woodham Academy. Um, so it's a local area network. Now that local area could be huge. You could work for a massive company and it could be, oh, let's think of an example. Uh, lots of companies are building big data warehouses in the desert. 
I don't know why they build it in the desert. You think it would be quite hot and computers really like colds. Actually, I do know why they build it in the desert. It's because it's really cheap, it's really cheap, because who wants to live in a desert? Uh, and you get a lot of solar electricity out of it as well. Um, so I suppose that's how you would cool it down by using the sun. Hmm. So, um, and these, these places are fast. Have you seen the new, oh, Google the new Apple um, uh, headquarters? huge it's absolutely huge and they will have a local area network it'd be one local area network these data warehouses will have one local area network okay they'll probably split it up into little chunks but collectively it's a local area network because it's in one location doesn't matter how big the location is it's in one location if you've got more than one geographical network joining another geographical network it's a wide area network so for example uh where my wife works it's a swedish company i think um so her network connects to a network in sweden two networks connected to each other so they can transfer files securely okay so that's a wide area network because it, it's more than one geographical location two or more geographical location networks joined together the internet's the the obvious one it's lots and lots and lots of networks joined together i've got a little home network you have as well because you've got a router I, I, I suspect and you connect to the internet so actually in some kind of weird way my computer is connected to your computer um i can't see it because i don't know what your ip address is and it'll be behind a firewall so it'll be even if i didn't know what your ip address was it would be difficult for me to access it but we are both connected to the same network it's a wide area network uh computer's gone off again let me do my blue steel is that what it was called blue steel you know what i'm talking about don't you there we go <laughs> uh, identify and describe the properties of the three main network topologies bus ring star all right um you can use a diagram to do this label it Label it, label it, label it, label it, label the diagram, label the diagram. Uh, label the server or the, for example, a star network is going to have something in the middle, so that's going to be a server or it's going to be a hub or a switch or whatever. I don't care. Put the thing in the middle, label it. Things around the outside, um, things connected to the uh, network, whether it's a, a desktop or whether it's a mobile phone by wireless or whatever label it network uh server workstations printer my printer's connected to my network label it printer um router if you're connected to the internet Okay, let's look at the next section now representation of number computers thought everything is binary but we as humans don't see everything as binary so we need to take things that we see and convert it into a machine readable form that can be saved and when we bring it back out of the computer it needs to be able to convert it back to something that we recognize be that sound text um moving images whatever okay so Let's have a look down through the list. Understand logic gates and construct truth, truth tables. I'm sure you're fine at and or and not gates, and I'm sure you're fine at truth tables, but you'll need to do them to two levels. So you will have to construct, construct a truth table that does something like not A and C, or um, A and B all knotted, so not A and B. Um, we've done that in class, Look back at your notes. If you're sitting there and you've got your exam tomorrow, uh, log into Moodle and click on the share thing link on the right hand side, type your username and password, in, and that's how you access your, do your documents. That's how you get access to your network space on Moodle. Uh, so they're all in there. You need to be able to do it to two levels. Truth tables to two levels, logic gates to two levels. Understand the different storage units and convert between them. So you should know how many bits are in a byte. You need to know how many nibbles are in a byte. You need to know how many bytes are in a kilobyte. Uh, and if I tell you um, there are two kilobytes, you need to be able to tell me how many bytes there are. So if I say I've got two bytes, you should know that. Well, that's um, 16 bits. 
And the way that you do that is you multiply the how many have I got two by the how many are in eight bits in a byte. So two times by eight gives 16. Uh, so if you've got two gigabyte uh, and you want to know how many megabytes in there, it's well, how many have I got two times by? Because I've got two gigabytes. How many megabytes are in a gigabyte? 1024. Two times by 24. 1024 will give you your answer. Convert two digit hex numbers to denary. Convert denary to hex. I'm going to refer you back to the Classroom Ninja videos. If you go onto uh, YouTube, search for Classroom Ninja. Uh, I've put uh, various different ones. Just work through the examples there. Explain why we use hexadecimal in computer. Well, first of all, we, we computer scientists, human beings, students use hexadecimal. Computers don't use hexadecimal. Computers don't use hexadecimal. Computers use binary. We write that down in hexadecimal form to make it easier for us. So if, um, if we see a binary number 1111, we write that down, that's 15, so we would write that down as an F. The reason why we write that down as an F, as 15 is, it's easier. If we write down 1111, one, 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 it's going to, we might make a mistake, especially if we're copying lots of ones and zeros from one place to another, and just making notes on them. We're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna write it down wrong. It's, it's gonna make your eyes funny if you have to read it. Whereas, if, if we as human beings write the hexadecimal equivalent because a nibble is the equivalent of a single digit of hex so two by uh, a byte sorry eight bits a byte is one two digit hex number i'm not explaining this very well i am explaining it very well but I, it's muddled if you don't understand what i'm saying let's start again so Explain why we use hexadecimal in computing. Well, we use hexadecimal in computing. Computers don't store things in hex. They store it in binary, but when we read it, we sometimes look at it in hex because binary is really complicated, all those ones and zeros. If we had to copy it out, we'd make a mistake. If I give you a lot of ones and zeros to copy out, there's going to come a point when you get a little bit bored and you, and you make a mistake or your eyes go funny. So you are less likely to make a mistake if you are copying out one, three, F, zero, C, rather than zero, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. And it's quicker as well. It's quicker to copy it out. It's quicker to write it down. Um, you're less likely to make mistakes. It's more readable. But it doesn't have anything to do with storage. It doesn't, it doesn't, it does not take less storage to store F than it does to store one, 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 one. Because binary uh, computers don't store F, they store the binary version. We, we as humans just write it down as F just to make it easy for us because one nibble equals a single unit of hexadecimal. What else is add together two eight bit binary numbers? Good luck with that. Explain an overflow error. An overflow error occurs when you add two binary numbers together. And the result, the answer, is larger than the um, space allocated for it. Then give an example. For example, if I add two 8-bit binary numbers together and the answer is a 9-bit answer, that's too big. It doesn't fit in the 8-bit um, area that's been allocated for the answer. All right, let's look at the next one, software. Compare proprietary and open source software. So if you want to compare something I said earlier, you write about one, you write about the other one. If what you have said is different, you've compared them, okay? Well, actually, even if you write about the same thing, you've still compared them. You've written about one, you've written about the other. So proprietary is when somebody owns the software code and they do not release that software code. Uh, imagine you wrote a Python program and you were to sell it you might wrap it up in a, an executable into an exe file that's not quite how it works but you could you can do that you can actually do that so you might wrap it up in an exe file so people can't see the code um you might add a license to it to say that you are not allowed to copy your code your python code you're not allowed to sell it you are not allowed to change it 
without permission from you. So you own the rights to that code. You own that code to do with whatever you want. And nobody else can make any changes or sell it or do anything with that code. You own it. So that's proprietary. Open source is different. Nobody owns it. So I could write a piece of code and I could put it on the internet and say, hey, you know what? This is open source. So somebody else could come along and download it and change it. And there may be some restrictions. I may say, eh, you still have to put my name on it. Or I may say, I'm giving this away for free, so you have to. If you make any changes, you have to give it away for free as well. So there's still some restrictions or there's still some, uh, um, some license to it. But generally, open source software, the code's available and can be downloaded and can be freely changed, modified, passed on. Uh, whereas proprietary software, it has a license attached to it. The code generally isn't given away, it's hidden. The compiled file is, is given away, the executable, um, and people can't modify it. They can't give it to somebody else. They can't sell it. There are restrictions on that. Explain the importance of reliability in computer systems. So why do computer systems have to be reliable? Um, because we depend on them, really. Remember... And the Amazon, was it the Amazon servers? The Amazon cloud servers went down in the, uh, last week or the week before and they took a load of websites offline. Um, and that was a huge problem. It was a huge problem. So let's take let's take a company like Amazon. Let's imagine their, um, their website, their shop goes offline. Let's imagine it goes offline quite a bit. Why is that a problem? It doesn't. Amazon make a lot of money because it is reliable. It's one of the reasons why they make money. So it's super reliable. Usually nothing's perfect. So what? Why? why does it have to be reliable? Well, we depend on it. We want to go to the Amazon website and we expect it to be there. We expect it to be able to use it. Why is it a problem if it isn't? Well, Amazon's going to lose money. If I go to Amazon to buy something and it's not working, then I'm going to go to eBay instead eBay get my money, Amazon don't. Um, reliable also means you have to be able to trust it as well. So if I go to Amazon and it's really slow, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a real problem. I will just go somewhere else. Um, it may be unreliable that I fill all my details in press send and I buy my oh I don't know uh, webcam I buy my webcam sitting I've got Amazon Prime so I expect it tomorrow take the day off work waiting for my webcam to arrive no webcam day after all right okay phone in sick no webcam day after Saturday still no webcam what's the problem if the website's not reliable, it may look like the uh, the order's being processed, but it may not have gone through. I may have got the email, but a system on the other side of the website, the warehousing system, may have broken. May have gone flying. They may have lost all of the processes processes for that day. So they may have taken the money, but they may have lost a record of who's bought what. Um, they may charge me twice if it's not reliable. Somebody may be able to extract the information when I'm making a transaction. And get my credit card details if it's not reliable okay identify different uh, utility applications let's look at this on a Mac if I open this out here it tells me the date and the time the weather where I am it tells me uh, that my my son my eldest is away all week oh, peace and quiet no dad's taxis that's that's got nothing to do with the computer system that's just stuff to do with my life Underneath that, we've got stuff to do with the computer system. So system information tells me how long my computer has been up. So in other words, when was the last reboot? 16 days ago, really? Um, how many processors are running? So how many things is it doing at the same time? The CPU percentage, how much of the CPU is being used? What percentage of the CPU is being used? Uh, how much is idle? How much spare capacity does the CPU have? Am I really hammering the CPU? I'm, I'm on the edge of, 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 
of the um, the limits. Oh have, I, oh, have I got plenty to go like I have here? Memory. You can see system information tells me the app memory. So how many apps I've got loaded and what the impact is of that on my RAM. Uh, how many memory I've got available. The network. It tells me my IP address for my one. Uh, it tells me um, the status that I'm on a mobile network. Does it tell me other things in here? Oh, look at that. I can scan for other things. Uh, it tells me the battery of my laptop. That's not a laptop. Why is that saying battery percentage 50%? It's not a laptop. But that's system information anyway. It tells me the speed of my network. It tells me if I'm downloading anything. Um, it tells me how much space I've got left on my hard disk, how much I've used. There's two marks there, how much I've used and how much space I've got left. Yeah. Um, so that's system information. There's diagnostics as well. Di not diagnostic utilities tell you if there's something wrong. So on a Mac, there's something called disk utility that will scan your hard disk and tell you if you've got any problems with permissions. And you press a button and it will fix it. But it's not the fixing bit that's important. It's telling you that there's something wrong. On Windows, you've got helper. Um, you've got help wizards. There appears to be something wrong with your computer, your Wi-Fi. There appears to be something wrong with your Wi-Fi. Uh, would you like me to search for a problem? Yes. And it takes you through and it scans and it diagnoses. It tells you. Um, it detects if there's something wrong with your Wi-Fi or your hard disk or your drivers or your, in, you know, your, your physical uh, network connection. Okay, so that's diagnostic diagnosis, like a doctor it tells you if there's something wrong. System information, information tells you about what you've got: RAM, hard disk, um, CPU, network. 